But it says it right here that that never happened. I don't care what you call it. It is not right. It did not happen. Okay, one last time. Look, I have the proof. Hmm. Hey, this is Michelle Spiber, your practical priestess of wisdom, and I want to welcome you to today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. Mwah. Join me on the flip as we get into some some stuff, y'all. I'm, I'm telling you, stick with me as we get into. Shush! Don't ruin this with your facts. I'll see you on the flip. Have you ever had that conversation with that person that no matter how much proof you give them, how much evidence you show them, how many times you point out something written in black and white that their belief is not right, they refuse to change? We've all had those conversations and I'm going to tell you that nine times out of ten, There are things about you that you believe that are wrong, that you're not willing to change. And so the wisdom smack that I have today is dealing with being able to get past that little thing about us that makes us so stubborn when it comes to overriding our belief systems. Now, if you'll permit me, I'm going to take you back and tell you a little bit of how this came to be. When our ancestors were in the hunter-gathering stage, this is pre-agricultural uh, revolution, when we congregated in smaller tribes and everyone in the tribe had a responsibility to the tribe as a whole. And what would happen, as is human nature, some people in the tribe were always more productive than others. Some folks were downright lazy. And as we started to increase our ability to conversate, to make words, to uh, communicate with each other, um, different things were uh, built in our brains to keep us from um, being duped, being used, uh, because there were a lot of times that you had to not trust your lion eyes or words, but your gut. And so we learned over the years to always trust ourselves more than we trust anybody else, no matter what they tried to show us, because that could mean you being the only one pulling the weight for a whole tribe of people who would lie to you. And, uh, and so through the ages, it came down to us holding our beliefs as higher above even evidence. Um, but that doesn't translate now as well that we have moved out of the survival age where you bring in an extra three berries maybe mean the life or death of people in the tribe to now where we're in the um, technological information age and we need to pay attention (laughs) to uh, things that are not true that we might believe that might go towards our detriment but we're still wired that way. Now, this is not an excuse. I'm not trying to say that people are just going to be people. There's hope for us all. And that is why the wisdom smack has uh, uh, hit me up, slugged me upside my head for the last few years to get over myself. And so let's talk about, shush, don't ruin this with your facts. Um, One of the things that I, I... uh, like about going through learning this and uh, growing is that it helps us to get a 360 degree uh, view of ourselves and how we uh, incorporate things into our belief systems. And you've heard me say this on the podcast before, to be willing to tip over every sacred cow, to be willing to tear down every belief that you've had. Um, Just like we rearrange our furniture, air out our homes, change from our summer wear to our fall and winter wear, we have to update and air out our belief systems. The, The thing that we have been taught 
through our ancestry of holding on to our own internal beliefs, no matter what, has come to a point now where it's time to update it. So what am I talking about? There is a name for this situation that I'm talking about, and it's called confirmation bias or my side bias, my side bias. But for the sake of this little chat we've got going on today with the podcast, I'm going to just call it confirmation bias. And the reason why is because there is a subsector of this that I want to get into as well. Uh, one of the richest people at this particular time of recording, I think he is still the richest person in the world, Jeff Bezos. When talking about his uh, company, people he likes to work with and employees has said this, that the smartest people are constantly revising their understanding, reconsidering a problem they have thought they've already solved. They're open to new points of view, new information, new ideas and contradictions and challenges to their own way of thinking. Now, that's what Jeff had to say about smart people. And there was this article that was written by Inc. Uh, magazine uh, that talked about you're not as smart as you think you are. And I thought it did a, a great job on, on condensing um, the confirmation bias down to this. And one of the things that they said was, is that there is a litmus test uh, that you can administer to see if a person is as smart as they think they are. And it, it dovetails off of what Jeff Bezos has said here. And it's simply this. If you have a person who is very certain about what they what they say, what they believe, and they use things like I think, and um, they use uh, things like I know instead of I think, then you're possibly dealing with a person who operates in a lot of confirmation bias. Now, Confirmation bias isn't as shallow as I've painted it to be. So let me tell you what it is. So it's actually the tendency. It's kind of like the echo chamber. It's the tendency to search for or anything you receive, you interpret it as, or you favor only the stuff that helps you affirm what you believe. And so it's kind of like you can show that person the evidence and they will still have the filter on to only see the pertinent information that backs up what they believe to the point of excluding information. It's kind of like inductive reasoning gone gone wrong, gone badly wrong. And what happens is, is that in this selectivity, they get into this area called a new realm of ignorance. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, today. Um, <laughs> it gets to the point where people who are dogmatic are zealous, aggressive in their uh, accusations of what is right and wrong are suffering from acute confirmation bias. And it it contributes to like overconfidence, like I said before, being arrogant, aggressive in this. And what they do is then they try to uh, suppose or, or, or impose, I should say, on you, their belief systems. Have you ever had someone who tried to proselytize you over to their religion or who tried in the grocery store, looked at your buggy and tried to convert you to a different way of eating or denying certain food, food groups? You'll see, you'll see that a lot of times these people have confirmation bias that for them, this is the only way. And I know it's cliche-ish, but it still stands to reason that it seems to me that all roads lead to Rome, meaning, you know, there are many ways to get to something and not no one way is going to be cookie cutter for everyone. And thus, going back to what Jeff Bezos said, smart people are always revising their understanding of something. They're always open to new points of view. They're always challenging their own way of thinking. And the person who is not willing to be flexible 
uh, the other day we did a podcast on how not to have an old mind. And that meant to be flexible, to have adaptability, to be open to things, to change up stuff. And it's it's that's what we're saying here. Because with confirmation bias, what it does is it gets you into a uh, a realm with many constrictions. And the reason why is because the more you reaffirm what it is that you believe or, or you only get into the echo chamber of only telling you the stuff that you already agree with, you shrink down your world and thus you hamper your natural ability to have curiosity, to continue to grow, and you become stunted. And no one wants to become stunted. No one wants to become stuck in their ways. No one wants to be trapped in their own mind, especially when your mind is made to help you break out of the mold and explore, you know? And it goes back to this hunter-gatherer thing, but it's something even more diabolical and deep. And that is a fear of being wrong. Yeah, I have (laughs) people that I know, and I'm not going to say how I know them, but as long as I've known them, they've never apologized. They'll buy you a gift or gifts, or they'll try to be nice and do something for you when they know they were wrong, but they can't bring themselves to say it. And I used to wonder, why can't you say you're wrong? I actually uh, talked about a book that I read a while ago uh, called Why Won't You Apologize? And she did a great job in there, but she didn't really talk about why people had a problem with apologizing or admitting they were wrong. And uh, this uh, this next study that I'm going to talk about that's that's still within confirmation bias, but it is getting a little deeper into it. It deals with uh, the fear of being wrong um, and how the weight of being wrong weighs on people to different levels and and dif- different um, um, amounts. And so there's a saying that uh, I loved and I I wrote it down and I wanted to share it with you guys today. And it goes like this. It says, the hardest things to say are, I love you. I was wrong. I'm sorry. And Worcestershire sauce. I thought it was the cutest thing. And so those are truly some hard things for people to say. Uh, But This is where the confirmation bias is also acting on people because it has this tendency to make people dig down deeper into what they believe and to the extent of what they will do. Um, They will get on international TV and use a Sharpie marker to, to still prove that they were right, even though all evidence shows that they were wrong. But I, I, Forgive me for that. Let me get back on to what I'm saying. But yes, it leads into new realms of uh, ignorance where the, the, the surface of, of what they don't know becomes even wider, even more expansive because they start to paint with a large brush and they figure, well, if I know this, then I know that. And then I can pl- apply what I know about this to other things. They are categorical people, meaning that everything is covered by this rule that I've instigated. And it really becomes hard. So let me tell you about this uh, study. Uh, It was done by Sloman and Fernbach. And what they said was that um, what they did was they uh, did some research and they had people who uh, professed to understand how a toilet worked. And so they were like, "Okay, you understand how a toilet works. And so they said they asked them to describe how the toilet worked. And they did. And they told them the functions of what we do with a toilet. But then when it came time for them to tell them the details of the plumbing of the toilet, what they said was, oh, well, my plumber knows that. 
And because in their minds, they knew the person who knew how it worked. In turn, they knew how it worked. And so that's how you can have this spread of new realms of ignorance, because what people will do is by proxy, if I know the people who know how to do this, then in turn, I know how to do this because they're only a phone call, a text or whatever away. And it's kind of a social evolution that means that we don't change our beliefs because we're duped by this laziness of affiliation and what they are, what uh, Shlalom, uh, Lord, Sloman <laughs> and Fernback were saying was that as a rule, strong feelings about issues do not necessarily emerge from a deep understanding. So people who may swear up and down that they know everything there is to know about healthcare, about plumbing, about uh, compensation, stock, poverty, whatever you want to say it, just because they are very dogmatic in their emotions and their feelings and their, um, uh, their, their certainty, that does not mean that they have a deep understanding. But then... There is the quintessential one for the folks in my area of uh, psychology we latch on to. And it is part of the confirmation bias that we've been talking about, but it's in the it's especially geared to, geared towards the field of psychology. And it is, like I said, uh, co- a cognitive bias, but what it does is, is it takes it a little further. And What they now do is this is where people mistakenly um, think that their cognitive ability is greater than it is, meaning that they believe that they're smarter than they actually are. So not only do we have the cognitive bias of where when someone has a deep seated belief, it doesn't necessarily uh is not indicative of a deep-seated understanding or knowledge, we now have the Dunning-Kruger effect where people mistakenly assess their cognitive ability as being greater than it is. And so it goes on, uh, the Dunning-Kruger or DK, I'm just going to say DK effect, is where due to illusionary superiority, people have an inability to recognize their own lack of, of ability. So when you going back to why won't these people apologize? Why won't they acknowledge they're wrong? Sometimes it does not have anything to do with their wrongness. They do not believe they are wrong because due to this illusionary superiority, they believe you're wrong. And there's no reason for them to apologize or say they're wrong. We see it all the time. There are people who commit crimes, heinous crimes, and in their world, their mind, they believe that they are in the right and everybody else is wrong. So why would they apologize or show remorse uh, or ask forgiveness for something that they feel they it was right. There have been many times people have done hateful things and you ask them, will you apologize? And they're like, no. And I would do it again if, if, if it came up again, because in their world, the DK effect is in full effect and they believe they are right. Um, it goes on with the DK effect, which, like I said, is a, a part of the cognitive bias where people think that they are uh, smarter than they are. It goes on to 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 dig into something that we talked about yes in yesterday's podcast about self awareness, and when they say when you don't have self awareness or a meta cognition, meta meaning over, meaning in the heavens, like Metatron, you know, the big angel. Um, so when you don't have a self awareness and a overview, a meta cognition. You can't objectively identify your competence or your incompetence. Uh, Bertrand Russell is uh, noted for saying that one of the painful things about our time is that those who feel certainty 
are stupid. And those with any imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. It's another way of saying what Jeff Bezos said when we first started, that he has observed and found that smart people are always willing to challenge their own thinking. And then he goes on to say this. He says, or as my grandfather says, the dumber you are, the more you think you know. And so I actually love that. So in our last few minutes together, what I want to do is I want us to embrace the wisdom of being aware, of being uh, aware and forewarned of the wisdom of understanding how the cognitive bias uh, works in our own lives. And what I would like for you to do is I want you to take a, 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 lit, a few litmus tests. I want you to look at what you think of uncertainty. You know, besides who you are, because I mean, even even that is, is, is not right. I will tell you who you are. You should be dying to self daily. You should be a brand new person each morning anyway, ready to go with the beginner's mind and have a brand new experience uh, based. Now you will have skills that you have built, but not resting on your laurels of what you did the day before last year, last week or whatever. But I want you to take that litmus test of certainty. What are you certain about? And then once you list those things, go through them and challenge all of them. And then the other litmus test I want you to do is I want you to look at uh, how often you have changed your opinion. Now, in the ink article that I mentioned, and I will, I, I think I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put the link in the description for today. In that article, at the last part of it, there was something that was great that was said, and this lady was talking about uh, the DK effect, cognitive um, uh, um, ability, and uh, when it came to confirmation bias. And uh, what she said was, is that if you ever want to know if uh, somebody is as smart as they think they are, she said, instead of asking them, oh, I'm sorry, it was a guy. He said, instead of asking them, do you know this for sure? Can you prove this or whatever? Ask them, when's the last time you changed your opinion? And if they are not able to answer that with any kind of believability or certainty, then yeah, you're probably dealing with someone who is enraptured in uh, the confirmation bias. And I think it's unfortunate, but it just comes down to the more you know and if you are willing to grow. You see, for some people, the cloak of false superiority is all they have. Uh, They deep down inside that shadow side convicts them and they know that they don't know as much as they would like but yet and still they cling to the things that they believe they know for certain even when it has been proven to be wrong let's take a look now at the world of conspiracy And I want to tread lightly on conspiracy theorists. And the reason why I say that is because not all the time are they wrong. I'm I'm going to say um, they could be just as right as they could be wrong. But what I will say is this, that depending on the personality type, you will have some who are willing to be open to be challenged, to challenge their own thinking, to keep looking, to truly embrace the idea that there is always another secret to be be unearthed uh, or revealed. Or you can have those that say, I know what I know. I don't care what you say. I know what I know. And uh, one time I was asking someone what made for conspiracy. And um, they weren't able to tell me as succinctly as uh, the resource that they pointed me to. And they had me re- uh, watch this documentary of this person who was a, a grand conspiracist. And I liked it because this person was willing to update what they thought. Um, Ike, 
Robert Ike or something like that. Oh my gosh, I'm messing up his name. But he he went on to say that, you know, he is not the same person he was when he originally started writing his books and that he is ever evolving. And I'm I'm quite thankful for that. But another thing was is when asked about conspiracies and those types of things, how do they become? And he was he was very open and he said something to this effect that if given enough time, you can connect any point to any other point. And that is true because everything is always connected. Les Brown has this saying that I like, Les Brown, the uh, famous motivational speaker. And he says that every story must have a point, but every point must also have a story. And I always think of the conspiracies and and how sometimes the conspiracies we 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 actually find out that they weren't conspiracies. They were real. And it just makes me wonder at how many people are locked in these imaginary worlds because they refuse to expand and to grow and to learn how to make as many dots connect as possible so that they can break out of these confined shells. Um, Going back, and you guys who have been listening to me know that right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of study on strategy. I'm actually doing it not only to be able to talk to you guys about it, but I'm, I'm working on some books that require uh, this skill set for the main character. And so that's why I'm doing a lot of study on um, uh, strategy. But one of the things that um, has become very prevalent is that the more fear a person refuses to deal with, meaning that they are driven by the fear, instead of acknowledging and embracing it and living with it like you would a death advisor, the more they tend to be conservative in their actions. And if you ever let an opponent who is not saddled with that burden, if your opponent ever finds out that you are driven by fear, meaning that you try to avoid it or it is um, the boogeyman, they know that you're conservative and that you're not willing to take risk and they can exploit that. But the more you embrace your fear and you make fear your your friend, <laughs> you because you understand fear is always going to be there. Fear is not going, not nowhere. And instead of trying to avoid it, hide from it, or um, appease it, you're like, okay, we're going to do this thing and uh, b- bring it. You become more progressive in an exploratory and adventurous in what you're what you're doing, and thus you have um, the Alexanders and the Napoleons and uh, the the Shaka Zulus and all of these great military strategists um, throughout the ages. And what these experiments that we've talked about today for cognitive bias all point to the fact that when you're operating within a cognit uh, um excuse me a uh, uh a um a bias that uh, the confirmation bias is so strong it means that you are ignoring or trying to quash a fear and usually it's a fear of being wrong or it's a fear of being found out that you feel like you're an imposter. Uh, check the podcast that we did on the imposter syndrome uh, for more on that. Or it's a fear of having uh, to face your reality and that you have painted this world um, that you like to view through because viewing things in the harshness of the reality that you're in is too painful. And so therefore, that's how you can have a lot of people who don't have a lot of experience, but yet and still they believe that they are the best. Um, There's another saying that says, seen a lot, experienced little. And depending on the context, it can be good or bad. In this context, it is not good. 
Just because you, quote unquote, lived through the person or the plumber does not mean that you know how to fix the toilet. And you shouldn't be so certain that you do. It's kind of like the person who comes to the artesian or the master and because they have uh, one violin and they've always had this violin, they try to tell the master violin maker, Stradivarius or somebody, how to do their job. (laughs) And so that's the... um, asinine level of of what can happen when your confirmation bias or aka my side bias goes unchecked. So guess what? Mm -hmm. My time is up. I thank you for yours. This has been Michelle Spiva, your practical priestess of wisdom with another uh, podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to check the show notes and support our podcast by either using our Amazon link at michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ or our Patreon, uh, PayPal donation, Cash App, or Venmo. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.